Welcome to the weekly worship from Susanna West, the United Methodist Church. We aspire to be a Christian community where all people grow in their love of God and are a force for good in Topeka and the world beyond. We connect with God and our neighbors through spiritual practices to worship, study, serve, give, and share. We pray that you'll find this worship experience meaningful and hear God speaking to you through it today. Good morning. Welcome to Worship with Susanna Wesley United Methodist Church. My name is Andrew Connor, and I'm the pastor here, and I'm so glad to welcome you to worship today. Today we begin a new series called The Bee Campaign, and we'll talk more about it here, uh, focusing on the scripture from Micah 6, 8. If you're here with us in the worship center or connected with us online for the very first time, we want to give you a particular welcome and invite you to get more connected in the life of the church. One of the best ways to do that is to uh, invite, uh, sign up for a weekly email newsletter. You can do that at our website, share your contact information, and we'll send an update every week with upcoming opportunities for you to connect with others and grow in your faith here at Susanna Wesley. For those of you that are here in the worship center, we want to make space for you to welcome your neighbor, to greet someone that you might not know, and remind someone of your name. So I invite you to take a look around, see folks you don't know, introduce yourself, and welcome them to worship. Will you please stand and welcome your neighbors? Good morning, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The risen Christ is with us. We are Susanna Wesley United Methodist Church. We seek to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. All people are welcome with no exceptions. God speaks to us through the words of music, and I invite you to remain standing this morning as we share in our opening hymn together.
Seated? And as you're seated, I invite you to join with me as we go to God in prayer. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, who created us in your image, grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression, and that we may reverently use our freedom. Help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations to the glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading of the morning comes from the Old Testament, a reading from Micah, chapter 6, verse, uh, verses 6 to 8 this morning. With what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with eternal burning, burnt offerings, with year-old calves? Will the, Lord be play, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with many torrents of oil? Should I give the oldest child for my own crime and the fruit of my body for the sin of my spirit? He has told you, human one, what is good and what, is, what the Lord requires from you is to do justice, embrace faithful love, and walk humbly with your God. I invite you to join in the responsive reading of the Psalms today from Psalm 99. The Lord rules, the nations shake. He sits enthroned on the winged heavenly creatures, the earth quakes. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them thank your great and awesome name. He is holy. Strong King who loves justice, you are the one who established what is fair. You worked justice and righteousness in Jacob. Magnify the Lord our God. Bow low at his footstool. He is holy. Listen to God's word for us from the New Testament this morning, a reading from James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or a sister who is naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you said, go in peace and stay warm, have a nice meal. What good is it if you don't actually give them what the body needs? And in the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. Will you please stand as you can to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ from Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. Listen for God's word for us. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue, as he normally did, and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and sat down. Every eye on the synagogue was fixed on him. He began to explain to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of scripture. You may be seated. When I was growing up, it was not unusual for my older brother and my younger sister and I to get into a conversation, a discussion, maybe even an argument about what was fair. We didn't use the word justice, but we tried to talk about, well, if there's this many cookies, how are we going to divide them equally? Well, that one has more chocolate chips. I don't care if it's bigger or smaller than the others. What is it when you think about people that you live with or that you live around and how things are equal or equitable or just? 
our family, our coworkers, our neighbors, the people that live across town? What is it that we might do as Christians when we seek to do justice as the prophet invites us to do? Today, we are launching the B campaign here at Susanna Wesley, along with hundreds of churches across the country. It was launched out of Church of the Resurrection in Kansas City, and it is not only a worship series, but designed to be an opportunity for us to revive our spirits and and live out our lives in a way that seeks to bring people together instead of dividing them. In this campaign season, we find divisiveness throughout politics and throughout our society. And Christians have a particular role to play because our gospel is about coming to faith in Christ, to responding to God's love where God first loved us, to seek to follow Jesus, and then finding that we are called to love our neighbors and our enemies, not just people that we agree with, but people that we disagree with as well. We're called to be salt and light in in the world, to be an influence in which others might look to us and see something that they might not find other places. And unfortunately, too often, Christians get caught up in the divisiveness in the world around us, and we can become as part of the problem as easily, perhaps, as we might be part of the solution. We have the chance to decide, are we going to help uh, address the the division in our country, or will we seek to try to bring people together? We we look around and we feel bad about it, and yet we often find ourselves participating in it, don't we? We want to stand firm for what we believe in, but we also want to be able to do that with love and grace and mercy. During this series, we're going to be focusing on a scripture passage with which many Christians are familiar. And it's hard to disagree with these words that we find in Micah 6, 8. Um, we've, seen them, we've read them just a minute ago, but I want to uh, see if we can read them together. Micah 6, 8. Let's read these words together. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Now, I want to be sure that you hear what the prophet is saying here. What the prophet is not saying is that God suggests that you do this, or that God would appreciate it if you thought about this or reflected on it. Instead, what the prophet is saying here is, what does the Lord require of you? Require of you. And over the weeks of this series, we'll focus on what it means to be just, to be kind, and to be humble. We'll consider the connection between religion and politics as the election comes closer, and then a reminder about what it means to love both our neighbor and our enemies. And we're going to be focusing on Micah 6, 8 for several weeks, and so I want to remind you about some of the history behind the books. You remember that Micah is a book in the Old Testament. It's one of what the minor prophets. Now that minor uh, designation has nothing to do with the importance of their message. Instead, it just has to do with the length. Micah is relatively short when compared to longer prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah. And Micah is a prophet in the 8th century BCE. So scholars believe that he is writing and speaking. His ministry may have been between 720 and 680. You remember before, um, uh, as time is going on, the numbers are getting less. And some portions of the book, some scholars disagree whether they were written uh, at a later time and added to what we find in, in our book of Micah today, or it may be that Micah has seen things that happen far into the future. And Micah is a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, you remember that the people of Israel had moved into the promised land. They'd, they'd come across the Jordan after wandering for years in the wilderness. And as time had passed, there began to be division among these 12 tribes uh, that came from the 12 brothers. And there is a, a, a bloodless revolution. There's a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah. Judah's capital was Jerusalem, and the capital of the, of the northern uh, kingdom of Israel was Samaria. And <laughs> these folks don't get along very well, even though they are related. Now, Micah the prophet is writing at a time when the Assyrian Empire is the great uh, political and economic and military power of the day. Assyria is about to attack and destroy the people of Israel because they have decided to rebel against the Assyrians. You see, the northern kingdom had in their mind that Egypt is growing more powerful and that Egypt will come alongside us and we will rebel against the Assyrians. So what they decided to do was to stop sending their regular tribute to Assyria. And what is an empire to do when they stop receiving their, imp- uh, their tribute but to send the military to make sure to 
quell the rebellion. The support that they thought they would get from Egypt turned out not at all to be the case. And during Micah's ministry, Assyria's armies are moving into place, or perhaps they have already attacked the northern kingdom. In the first chapter of the book of Micah, if you were to take time to read through it this week, you'll find that there is a warning that destruction is coming. Micah can see what is ahead. And then in chapters 2 and 3, he describes why this destruction is coming. It's not for no reason. And here we see in Micah chapter 2, verse 2, and remember, he's talking about the people of Israel here. They covet fields and seize them, houses, and take them away. They oppress a householder and those in his house, a man and his estate. Do you see what's happening here? The rich and the powerful are getting richer by oppressing the poor by taking property that doesn't belong to them. And Micah is warning both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom by pointing out this corruption and the greed that has filled the population. You've you've brought this on yourselves, he says. Because when you find a country that persistently oppresses its people, where the rich are getting richer and those on the margins continue to be pushed down and persecuted, you can expect that, that this nation is not living in God's favor. And these are the warnings in chapter 1 and 2 and 3. And then perhaps somewhere between chapters 3 and 4, when those were written, the Assyrians have conquered the northern kingdom. The ten tribes of Israel of the northern kingdom were captured and were scattered throughout the empire. Over the generations, they are absorbed into the Assyrian empire and they are lost. Maybe you've heard of the ten lost tribes of Israel. This is what they're talking about here. But that's not the end of Micah's ministry. The kingdom has been destroyed, yet Micah still has words for the people. In chapters 4 and 5, God makes promises for restoration. God says, I will walk with you and I will heal you. And there is a promise that God has not abandoned them. Can you imagine? The Assyrian Empire has conquered the kingdom completely, and yet Micah reminds the people that even in this terrible circumstance, when everything you know it has been destroyed, when you have been taken to a foreign land, even then God is with you. Even in the most difficult circumstances in our lives, God is with us. God has not abandoned us. And then chapter 6 goes back. It remembers a time before the northern kingdom is destroyed, and it draws a picture of a metaphor of of a courtroom scene in which Israel, the kingdom, is on trial. The jury is the mountains. There's a prosecutor and the attorney, and Israel asks, recognizing that they have been indicted, with what should I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with entirely burned offerings, with year-old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crime, the fruit of my body for the sin of my spirit? What should I do, says the people of Israel? And in this scene, the one on the other side says, no, not at all. God doesn't want any of those things. It's not what God is looking for. Instead, In verse 8, he has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? For 2,700 years, both Jews and Christians, people of all stripes around the world have looked at this text and understood it to be clear direction about what God is looking for from us. So what is justice? It's our focus for this week. The Hebrew word for justice is mishpat, and this word appears hundreds of times in the Old Testament. It's a Hebrew word that might be helpful for you to know a little bit about. It means literally a judgment that comes down in a court, and sometimes it means handing down a sentence. Sometimes it's justice for a penalty for something that's done wrong, but it's also deciding about what is right and what is wrong, and then trying to take action to make things right after that. Often when the prophets speak about justice, it's because some people are not receiving it. And when we think about proper judgment and what justice looks like, we can look around our world today and see examples of where these things are just not right, can't we? Sometimes injustice is enormous when one nation goes to war against another. 
These are grave injustices, terrible circumstances, and there are countless examples of injustice in the legal system in our country. Dozens and hundreds and countless people accused and convicted for a crime that they didn't commit. But this word, this idea of justice also has to do with the everyday judgments that we have to make in our life. Do we see clearly what is right and what is wrong? Sometimes we can't always tell precisely what is right or is it this other thing that is actually right. We believe in justice, but we find it difficult at times to tell, can't we? We are all guilty at some time of not using the right kind of judgment and in the process bringing pain on ourselves and perhaps at times in the lives of other people. And this is why we're called to speak up for those who are powerless and can't speak up for themselves. Consider Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9. Speak on behalf of the voiceless and for the rights of all those who are vulnerable. Speak out in order to judge with righteousness and to defend the needy and the poor. Do you hear what the author is inviting us to? To take action to seek justice. To speak up for the needy, the poor, the stranger, the immigrants, the widows, and the orphans. We, si- we see this encouragement and guidance throughout the scripture to speak for justice, and not only to speak, but to act for it. To speak up when, for someone that we know when someone has said something about them that we know just isn't true. It's justice, and it's this idea of a shared moral vision. It's the idea and ideal that we have in our country at times. At our best, we care deeply that people receive justice and are treated fairly and with equity. And wherever we see someone being hurt or humiliated or oppressed or made to feel that we don't matter as Christians, it's our responsibility to speak up and to take action, to love our neighbors in response to what we see in the world around us. Fairness, consideration of the suffering, those who have been mistreated, we are speaking up or standing up to make the right judgment, to seek to do the right thing. And we can all agree on this, can't we? But we might disagree at times about exactly what that looks like or how we achieve it. What are the actions to take to get there? We might all want to seek justice, but we seek to recognize that when someone has another position, We can, in the midst of it, be kind as well as humble. The challenge is that we disagree on exactly what this looks like or how we go about getting there. We might do our best, but also struggle to understand exactly what the action is to take in our own lives or perhaps in the political realm or in a social society to pursue justice and to speak up for what is right. What if all of us decided that we'd try to make the right judgments? about people and issues, if we're going to pursue justice and to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves? What would it look like in Shawnee County and Topeka if everyone connected with Susanna Wesley said, you know, I'm going to do my best to try to take action, to be just and to be kind and to be humble? You see, the good news is that God gives us the power to do this when we're not able to do it on our own. Jesus speaks up in the temple and says, this prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is going to happen. Those who don't have enough food will be fed. Those who are Push down in society will be lifted up. We see it throughout Scripture over and over again, and we have the chance to live into it today. So this week, consider right judgments. Reflect on the way that you're living your life. Look in the country around us, around the world. Are there places, where are the places where there's an injustice? And how might we take action to move towards what God has in mind for all of us? Will you pray with me? Oh God, we ask that you would help us to be just. That you would encourage us to take action when we see things that we know are wrong. And when we're uncertain about how best to take action, give us clarity and guidance. Help us to follow after you faithfully. And we offer all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
opportunities that we have in the life of our church about ways that you can get connected and take action um, in part of God's kingdom. One of those is coming up tomorrow, October 3rd at 7 o'clock as our Jump House meeting. This is a tangible way for you to take action and to name some of the issues that you see in Topeka and Shawnee County and how we might work together. Um, this will be gathering here at the church. If you, uh, we had one a couple weeks ago. If you weren't there a couple weeks ago, I invite you to be here tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock to take action for justice. It's the beginning of our annual cycle with the Topeka Jump Ministry Network, and I invite you here at the church tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Also, uh, coming up at the end of this month is our annual Trunk or Treat event. We invite you to make a difference in two ways. One, we invite you to bring candy to give away. There will be hundreds of kids. It's a safe and fun and free event, and we'd love to be able to not run out of candy, and you can help make that happen by giving, uh, bringing candy into the office. There's a basket where we're collecting that. Also, if you're available on that evening, we'd love to invite you to sign up for a trunk, to decorate a trunk, and to help bring joy and uh, community building here in the life of uh, our part of town here in Topeka. And now I'd like to invite um, Holly Tapley as a uh, member of our congregation and also a part of the Great Plains Conference staff. Uh, this week, we're beginning, as well as the B campaign, it's our annual uh, ministry funding plan commitment. We'll be inviting you to make a commitment on October 23rd in 2023, and we're highlighting some of the ways that your giving makes a difference and some possibilities that it might make a difference in the year ahead. And Holly's here to share a ministry funding plan testimony. Thank you, Andrew. I want to invite you in this upcoming year to join me by pledging to our ministry plan here at Susanna Wesley United Methodist Church. As a clergy member of the Great Plains Conference, my membership is actually with the conference and not the church, but this is my church home, and I pledge for the ministries that take place here, and I invite you to join me this year so that uh, we can make a difference in the world, we can make a difference in our community, and part of our giving is the mission shares. The mission shares is important to the work and the ministry of the Great Plains Conference for the programs that we do. With the payment of our mission shares, we can make sure that there is a United Methodist presence on all of our uh, colleges and universities in Kansas and Nebraska. By pledging and giving 100% of our mission shares, we can make sure that our disaster response volunteers are able to respond as we will be heading to Florida very shortly, I was informed this morning. Uh, but that we can respond with compassion, we can respond with care, uh, whether it is here or beyond, uh, which we do. By paying 100% of our mission shares, we can make sure that we are playing active roles within our community with anti-racism initiatives, with mental health strategies, with food pantries, school supplies, the UMCOR cleaning kits, and the other two kits that they have. By providing ministry for our children and for our youth on a conference level. That is what our mission shares go to provide for each congregation in the Great Plains Conference. Because of our mission shares, our Congregational Excellence Team can provide you with over 50 resources uh, and more. If you go to the Great Plains Conference website, look for Congregational Excellence Ministries, you will see the Congregational Excellence Playbook. And this is just a sample of the ministry opportunities that we can provide each local church. And so I invite you to take a look at that. So again, for 2023, I invite you to join me in not only paying our tithe, but giving toward the ministry so that we can continue to change lives through Jesus Christ in our community, our state, our nation, and our world. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. We'll be inviting you to make a commitment on October 23rd, and you'll hear more information in the weeks ahead about our ministry funding plan for 2023. We come now to the time in our worship service in which we gather and pause for prayer. 
And during our time of prayer, there's a variety of ways that we'll invite you to pray. You can pray with your eyes open. In a moment, you'll see names of individuals and families that we're keeping in our prayers for a variety of reasons. You might pray with your eyes closed where you are. You might also decide that you'd like to light a candle up here on either side. There'll be a candle lit, and we'll invite you to come forward um, to light a candle as a symbol of your prayers and as a reminder to be the light of Christ in the world. We'll begin our time with some moments of quiet, um, inviting you to listen for the way that God is speaking to you and that you might uh, offer your own prayers to God. So I invite you to join with me as we go to God in prayer. Will you pray with me? O oh God, you who framed the brightness of the very first light in creation, we ask that you would put away the arrogance and the hatred and the anger that divides us in the church and in our society. Fill your faithful people with the light of truth so that we will be one in faith and hope and love. You who delivered your people from the misery of bondage and slavery to the land of promise, Set us free from enslavement, division, disunity, and distrust in our public life and labor. Bring light and guidance to those in authority with the light of vision to lead the nation's peoples to greater unity and agreement. You, O oh God, pattern the stars and call the sun into being. You appointed the moon and chartered all the stars in the sky, pattern the hearts of people everywhere to see in each other the beauty of the universe and the splendor of creation so that divisions of race and class, gender and ethnicity may dissolve into one common humanity. O oh God, you delight in the complexity of creation and the splendor of each created one. Help us to delight as well in the diversity of the earth. Inspire your people to care for the planet and its animals and repent and return to you when we abuse, misuse, and neglect our fellow human beings and creatures. You who welcome into the brilliant life all those who have lived and died, receive those lives who have been cut short by violence, warfare, and strife. Shine the light of hope on those faithful departed. God, give us strength, to respond to your call to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you and each other. Set us free from the venom of division and distrust that infects our hearts and fractures our nation. Following the way of Jesus, cast out our fear, all for the sake of your love. Amen. As we've taken a moment to check in with God in prayer, I invite you to check in to worship and let us know that you're connected today. Whether you're in person or on, joining us online, you can use the Church Center app to check in. You can use the form at our website or if you're, you can complete the Connect card in the pew in front of you and return it to the box at the welcome table. While you're taking a moment to check in, we also invite you to give to our ministry funding plan. Um, this uh, makes ministry possible here at Susanna Wesley and your giving helps fund all of our ministry in the life of the church. 
We also want to invite you to, uh, the uh, sp- today is one of uh, six uh, special offerings in the life of our church, uh, which is the World Communion Sunday. In a few moments, we'll be celebrating World Communion Sunday. Uh, we'll be celebrating communion, and we invite you to give uh, to support this special uh, cause in the United Methodist Church. Let's take a look at this video. Maybe. We've got a video. Arrow back, and we'll wait for it. There it is. You can give today in the Church Center app by selecting World Communion Sunday after you select a dollar amount. Or if you're here in person and you want to write World Communion Sunday in the memo of your check or on the envelope, you can drop it in the basket on your way out as well. This is one of the ways that we make a difference with United Methodists around the world. As you're taking a moment to consider these ways of giving, I'd like to invite the choir forward um, to sing our special music today.
And now I invite you to stand as we're able for our closing song today, When the Church of Jesus... And the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for connecting with Worship with Susanna Wesley this week. I hope that you'll join us again in the days ahead. To learn more about Susanna Wesley, visit us online at swumc.org.